This winter, on one of the coldest days, of course, my central heating gave out. And what I had to do, of course, was get a bunch of electrical heaters and put them around the house so the pipes wouldn't freeze. And I did have a couple of these construction heaters, which are 4.8 kilowatt, 240 volt heaters that have a big giant 30 amp plug on them. And I do have one outlet near my circuit breaker panel with a plug with these, but I really wanted one upstairs. Now, in most North American homes, you have a 30 amp plug for a clothes dryer. And the unfortunate thing is, it is not the same plug as the one for the heater. The main difference being that the clothes dryer plug has a neutral connection, whereas the heater plug only has two live connections. It's actually very unfortunate because they could have made these plugs so that the other two terminals were identical, and in that case you would have been able to plug the construction heater right into the dryer outlet, but you can't because the plugs are incompatible. So what I decided I really should do is make an adapter so if I end up with a faulty propane heater situation again, I can very quickly plug in the second construction heater and get four and a half or 4.8 kilowatts worth of heat, which will make things a lot more comfortable until the propane system is going again. So to that end, what I did was I picked up this cord from the Habitat for Humanity Restore for 10 bucks. So it was about half the price what you would pay in a regular hardware store. And I also got the socket to plug it in and from Amazon, I got a plate to go over the socket, and I also had the box and cover plate in my bin of parts. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is basically wire the dryer plug into this box and this plug so that the construction heater can plug into it and run off the dryer outlet. So the first thing we need to do is take a look at these two rather strange plug-on connectors at the end of the dryer cord, or as it's typically called a dryer whip, and see if we can get them off because that'll make things just a little bit easier um, to work with. And it looks like there's sort of a plastic latch in there keeping the plugs in place. So what I'm kind of hoping is by sticking a screwdriver in, I can disengage the latch and pull the cord out. And um, Fortunately, that does not seem to be working. Ah, it did work. So here's the easy one. Now the harder one will be to do both of these, but I guess if we do them one at a time, there is some hope of being able to disengage the plastic latch. That worked, and same sort of thing for the red. Oh, they're out, so that's great. Now, these what look like quick connect type spade connectors are really not gonna be very useful to us. And what I was hoping to do 
was perhaps just cut these off here and put the whole metal thing right into the holes in the socket. But the unfortunate thing is there actually is insulation going right into those connectors. So I think what I'm going to have to do is in fact cut these wires at the connectors and strip them. Really too bad. Now this wire, the white one, is the neutral and we're not going to actually use it, but I'm going to cut it off and strip it anyway as probably the best way to put it in a MAR connector so that we can just prevent that from hitting the grounded part of the metal case, which sh being neutral shouldn't make any difference, but they should not be touching. Now, I'm not even sure if my wire stripper will even work with a wire this big, so we might actually have to do it the old fashioned way. And it's sure looking like that. So, actually using the white wire is a good wire to experiment on. I'm going to just very carefully try and put a cut right around it without nicking the inner conductors. And now that I've tried doing that, let's see if we can maybe expand on that a bit with the pliers and get it off. This is certainly really good insulation, which is a good thing. And in fact, this is turning out harder than I would have expected. I'm, of course, trying to be very careful not to injure the conductors at all. Now we're beginning to see sign of the conductors now. Can we pull it off? Yes. So that's done and we will just trim away a little bit of it but that's probably going to be good enough now we'll do the same thing for the red and black and because of the way the plug is situated what we're probably going to really want to do is cut the green so that it is perhaps half an inch shorter than the, the red and black, which will sort of go in here and the green will go in here. Green being ground, red and black being live. So I guess we'll start off with the black since that is the shortest. And once again, Maybe I'll be a little bit more generous with the amount of insulation that I'm going to try and cut away. And this is, of course, where you got to be also very careful that you don't cut yourself with the sharp knife, as I did a few videos ago. And it looks like one side of it needs a little bit more cutting. And that's off and that came off rather nicely. So what we'll do now is cut the red one to the same length as the black one, like that, and repeat the process.
There we go. And yeah, they're about the same length, so that's good. The copper part of the red is slightly longer than the black, so I'm just going to even things out and cut it to about the same length. Now we're going to want to do the same sort of thing to the green one. And if I just sort of measure and say it's going to go in this far for those two, maybe we should cut off the green one at about here. There we go. And one more time. And the green, of course, being ground, is the one that you hope will never ever need to be used. But if it is used, it'll probably be a lifesaver. So it is, in fact, just as important as the other two, if not more so. And it was interesting, apparently, in the really old days, um, some of the stoves were wired with simply a 240 volt, two live wires, and one sort of ground that was also used simultaneously as the neutral. Because most stoves in North America have a couple of 120 volt plugs on them. And of course, as the electrical code was improved, that went out of favor. And of course, you wouldn't be allowed to do that today. There we go. So now they're all stripped. Now we have one other problem, and that is this box here has a connector in it, which I'll just take out, which will be absolutely fine for this wire. But I think what we really need to do, what we'd really like to do, is take this piece of rubber off so that we can actually put the connector right over here. And I think to do that, I'm going to maybe try and use my Dremel to cut this off. Okay, now you can't see it, but I put on my safety glasses and we're going to see if this cutoff disc is any good against this rubber. Seems to be working. And let's just see if we have any hope of prying this apart at this point. We're getting close. There is just a little bit in the center here. Yeah. So now we have to just see if we can pry it off. Yep. And did we damage the cable very much? No. So that was a success. So now the nice thing is this connector or strain relief or whatever you wish to call it can go over all the wires, including the big outer cladding of the cable like that. And we can put it in the hole like this. And hopefully these cables are flexible enough. I think they will be that we can screw them nicely onto the connector when it's in like that. So the one thing I am looking for is the nut for the connector and we'll put it on here. By the way, this is a sort of larger than the most common connector 
because this cable is of course much larger than the normal 14-2 that's typically used for house wiring. So this is actually a three-quarter inch um, hole style connector. And um, I'm going to just try and get this a bit more vertical. that and maybe use a screwdriver to just tighten this nut a bit and yeah I know that banging things with a screwdriver is generally not a good thing to do but this nut is now nice and tight and um, what we'll do is tighten these screws so that the cable is nice and tight in the connector like that And what I've just realized, of course, is what I need to do is, in fact, attach a ground wire from this to the box as well as to the plug. So I certainly wasn't thinking when I cut this off. Um, but that doesn't matter because I'm just going to go look and see if I can dig up some appropriately thick wire to use as the ground wire. So I found some number eight cable and this is the ground wire from it so that should be more than adequate for this application. So what I'm going to do is we'll loosen this screw a bit the yes the ground wire will fit around it and what we're also going to do is in fact um, use a gigantic mar connector to connect the ground to this cable and that's how we're going to do it So I'm trying to get it on really nice and tight because we want it to be a really good connection and even though you can't see it that looks pretty tight to me so now what we'll do is wind this wire around the ground and um, actually I'm going to reposition things just a bit so that this is sort of out of the way of the the plug itself like that and we'll just tighten that up so now we have a very good high current ground on the box and that's really important because if one of the current carrying cables were to get loose we want to make sure that the ground from the box where one of those cables might hit is really good now just looking at this box a little bit more what we would probably like to do is have this cable situated something sorry this connector what we'd like to do is have this connector situated about like this because that's the direction that the the cable for the heater is going to go 
If not, we'll do it sideways if these wires aren't long enough. Um, and I suspect they aren't long enough, so what we'll do is see if they are long enough to do sideways like that. Are they? Is that going to fit? Even that won't be enough. So I guess what we'll do is make it a little bit less optimal. We'll situate the plug like this because it really is only a temporary thing. And what that means is the heater power cable will also come out in this direction. And somewhere along the line, the screw for the ground came out and I found a somewhat bigger screw for the ground that will in fact work. And since it is ground and everything around here is ground, um, that's going to be fine. So the only other thing we really should do before we start putting the top on and wiring this thing in, which we'll probably have to do um, to some extent with the top in place, is cover this off with another one of those big giant MAR connectors. Again, in this case, just to protect it. And it's not gripping very well. So I think what I'm going to do is switch to a slightly smaller MAR connector. That's certainly going on much better. And just as a bit of a safety thing, I'm going to use some electrical tape and put some tape around here just to make sure that under no circumstances will this come off. So, okay, so that's done. Now, the question will be is given the limited length of these wires, and of course, you really should have wires about this long in a box like this, um, how can we best do things? Are we better off to screw this on, have the wires come out and screw them into here? I think we might be better off if we screwed this on here and then attach the wires like that. So to that end, I need to take these screws out. Not quite the right screwdriver, but I think it's going to be good enough. And we're going to do it like that, yes. Of course, this one is not threading properly there. Now it is. So we'll just put these two screws in to hold it in place. Like that. I wonder if the bigger screwdriver will fit these screws. And, oh yes, it does. So I can just get them in just a little bit tighter. I guess it fit the one screw, 
better than the other so they're not quite identical they were just from a jar of screws that i had so it's not surprising there we go so that's nice and tight now what we'd like to do is get these two shorter wires in and the black is in fact the shortest so let's see how far we can get these nuts out without them falling out and the next thing is is how far we can get these things into the holes And again, this is why you really need longer wires. And um, I think, in fact, that must, must might be what I need to do. Will these fit? That goes in about that far. It's really not enough space to be working. So I'm going to just loosen this connector and we'll strip off some of the outer cladding of this cable over here with the intent of giving us a little bit more working room. This is not the optimal way to do things. So what we'll do is maybe we'll cut an inch and a half of the cladding. Now being very careful not to harm the wires. And in fact I already did harm the ground. We'll see if we deem that to be so bad that I need to just completely cut off the end of this wire but it just shows you how careful you have to be when you're doing something like that no it looks like I just cut the insulation on the ground so for this application what I'm gonna do is just cover that with some electrical tape luckily it was the ground And now we'll just carefully cut around this, maybe in two layers, first to get it past the strain relief connector. our way around a bit to get the rest of this off without damaging any of the inner cables. Just trying to get this to be rather uniform in length so we get the maximum available length of the inner wires. That'll probably be more than enough 
and um, yeah, there is a slight slit in the green wire over here, but because it's ground and this ground is completely uninsulated anyway, um, that'll probably just be good enough. So what we'll do is we'll get our clamping part of the connector back on. And now hopefully we can proceed to wire up the socket. get the outer cladding of the cable under the clamp. There we go. And now I think without a doubt we have more than enough wire to make life a lot easier for ourselves. And I'm even going to slip this wire under the green. That'll just give us even a fraction more length. Yeah, now we can really get to it. So if we look at this wire. And I'm sort of debating whether I should tin the end with solder just to make things a bit neater, but I don't think so. I think that'll fit rather nicely. And um, yeah, it just goes in there just like that. And I'm going to use one finger to hold it. And I'm being actually very careful to make sure the insulation doesn't actually go anywhere into the part where the, um, the, the cable clamping mechanism um, will clamp the cable because we obviously don't want to clamp the insulation. But this should be nice and tight. And of course the good thing is too is on this connector it's a 30 amp connector and 30 amp cable and the heater is only actually going to be using 20 amps. So that also means that um, nothing is going to be being stressed to the limit. So here we go. The red one is now in. Same sort of thing. And we'll tighten it up. Once again, nice and tight. There we go. Yeah, that's a good connection. And now the last thing we need to do is get the ground connected. And before we do that, let's just see how we're going to orient it. You know, we now have enough cable that we can, in fact, orient this in the desired direction. So I'm just going to snake the ground around to here. And the unfortunate thing is it is, of course, a rather stiff cable. And anyway, we'll get it, we'll get it in the ground hole and tighten it up with our non-ideal screw. Let's get the black out of the way. Good and tight. So now we have an excellent ground. And I'm just going to adjust the ground wire a bit so that it doesn't kink anything, so that it doesn't touch anything that might be live, which of course would be bad. And yeah, this just will fit right on top here, like that. 
and I am just going to go get the appropriate screwdriver for these. Oh, actually, the red one should do it. Yeah, that's the nice thing about these Robertson screwdrivers. They're actually color-coded with red being the sort of medium-sized one and the most common. Um, blue is the typically smaller one and black is the bigger one which is really uncommon and there is actually also a yellow which is a tiny one which is really rare but in all cases they're really good for this type of screwing because unlike the others they don't slip off so that came together really nicely now the way this is situated one might even sort of say you know you don't really need to put this cover on it but i'm going to put the cover on it anyway and the reason is even though this metal should be more than enough protection um, the cover does add one additional layer of protection on the whole system such that if there were to be a short in here and a big arc or something were to occur well there's just one more thing to prevent any sort of electrical fire getting out and since I have the cover anyway it's a good thing to do it is unfortunate they don't make or at least there aren't easily available utility covers for these connectors at least i didn't see any that might be a sort of a covid supply chain issue these days because the one thing that's not nice about these covers is the sharp edges which would be fine if this box was inside a wall and it was just the cover sticking out over the drywall and that, by the way, is the intended purpose of these um, square faceplates with the protrusion is to stick through drywall so that you could actually have a bigger box like this under the drywall. But the nice thing is we are now done. So now just to show off, I'm going to get the construction heater and we'll see how nicely it plugs into there here is the construction heater here is the construction heater's plug and again just look at the difference of those plugs they essentially have the same ground connector and you know if one or the other just had the same um, orientation of the live spade connectors you'd be able to plug this thing into the dryer outlet so what a shame and certainly there wasn't much thought about backward compatibility when they came up with all of these plugs but so be it so anyway we'll just see how does this fit it of course should fit in there nicely and there we go um, I do not have easy access to my dryer plug because I'd have to move the dryer and the washer because they're on top of each other so I'm not actually going to plug it in but I am going to just do a little bit of testing with the voltmeter can you see it there maybe you can see it better over here yeah and of course it would work a lot better if I plug the red lead into the ohm connection it's working first thing we should do is test to see if ground is connected and it is and we'll also test if this ground is connected to the metal on the construction heater just to make sure that all the grounds are okay and they certainly are 
I'm actually having trouble getting a good connection because this metal on the construction heater is a bit corroded, but it is a good connection, so that's good. Um, actually, that's not the ground that I was touching. That is, yes, that is the ground. And now the neutral should be connected to absolutely nothing else. And what we're actually seeing now is my fingers, so I won't touch the leads. Yes, it's not connected to the ground. It's not connected to either of the lives, so that's good. The two lives, depending on the switch on the heater, yes, they are showing somewhere around 8 ohms or so. You've got to take that with a bit of a grain of salt because these meters are not great at um, low ohmages. And I don't know if I can turn the thermostat completely off. I think I can. I don't know if you can see the thermostat. It's, it's over here. I think that's off. So in theory, when it's off, we should get nothing across the live leads and we're getting nothing. And if I turn it on, and you might have heard the click, yes, we can see we're getting what looks like 8.7 ohms. Um, if we've got 240 volts going in, and if we had a 10 ohm resistor, we would be expecting 24 amps. So I would suspect the meter's off a bit. The other thing that can happen is for a lot of these wires, and it's probably got a nichrome type heating element in there. You know, 8 ohms is probably right because what usually happens is when metals heat up, their resistance goes up. So the way this thing probably works is it starts off drawing maybe 24, 25, 26 amps of power, and then as soon as it gets hot, it drops down to the um, expected 20 amps. So that is a success. And what that means is I can now take this little gizmo and just throw it in my utility room. And if my propane central heating fails again, either this winter or in some future winter, I'm all set up to get one of these construction heaters going upstairs and with 4.8 kilowatts in the basement and 4.8 kilowatts upstairs. That's certainly enough to keep the house um, warm enough so the pipes don't freeze. And add a few more plug-in, you know, 1.5 kilowatt heaters and one can certainly survive with a bunch of sweaters and jackets and so forth. So that brings this video to an end. See you next time.